Guys, good Wednesday afternoon and welcome to the I Love Seville show. My name is Jerry Miller. It's good to be with you on a Wednesday, a glorious day to be alive. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville network. Crystal Napier on Wednesdays. She is fantastic. She will join us in about 16, 17 minutes on the program. Wednesdays mean Crystal Napier from Renee's Boutique. She's the owner of that fabulous, fabulous locally owned business. We'll talk vaccines. We'll talk positivity in Charlottesville. I'm going to commit myself and our team to delivering something positive on every show moving forward. Anytime I host the I Love Seville show, you will have positivity in the rundown. I will commit the team and myself to this mission throughout 2020. Throughout 2021, excuse me. We need that positivity. And I got four or five items here that are going to make you smile. Folks, we have to talk medical cannabis. We have to talk legal retail cannabis. Yesterday, the governor of Virginia put a plan in place for retail legal cannabis in Virginia by January 1, 2023. I will say it again. Yesterday, the governor of Virginia, a man of science, a man of medicine, a doctor himself, he put a plan in place. Now it goes to the Virginia Assembly, a Democratic-controlled Virginia Assembly that very much favors the legalization of cannabis. The governor put a plan in place yesterday that will legalize retail cannabis across the Commonwealth of Virginia the 1st of January, 2023. That's going to be a topic on the show, and I'm going to localize it on the program and ask this question again. How is this flower going to impact Charlottesville and Central Virginia? Madison County is chomping at the bit to seduce romanticize, lure, attract, just bring a medical cannabis facility to Madison County, north of uh, Charlottesville, okay? They're fighting to have a medical cannabis facility. So is Fluvanna, so is Nelson, so is Albemarle. You have the following municipalities. There's one medical cannabis facility per health district. The one for this health district has not been assigned. Fluvanna, Nelson, Almaro, and Madison are all fighting to be the host of this medical cannabis facility. We'll localize this topic today on the Isle of Seville show. We'll talk pop-up shops. We'll talk Virginia Tech, who announced that in-person classes for the spring semester will be 6%, only 6% of students in person in Blacksburg this spring semester. We got a Virginia basketball game on the docket today, and we have to ask this question. YouTube yesterday became the latest social media platform to strip the president of his constitutional rights. What is this going to do to a man who's clearly a narcissist? A man who clearly, when he's told he cannot do something, uses that to fuel his fire. What is stripping this guy and his constitutional rights, his right to free speech, going to do to him from a motivational standpoint? 70 plus million Americans voted for this person, and many of the 70 million cling to his every word. This guy has tremendous influence. The expectation is, at least my prediction, is some kind of Trump television or media platform. I'll save that to the bottom of the show. A lot of um, other items we got to get out of the notebook. Let's first talk vaccine. How many people in this town are asking yourself this very question? Why in the Lord's name do we not have this vaccine in more people's arms? We have vaccinations that are sitting on ice. Vaccinations that are literally going bad. I've heard from three, four different friends, four different friend groups, one on Monday. I'm not going to say any names. This, these friends are on a short list, and they get text messages or phone calls from doctors that have access to the vaccinations, and they're told if you can drop anything and get to our particular location and get the vaccine in your arm, we'll give it to you and move you up the line. The doctors are doing this because they're literally throwing them away. 
And as people of science and as, and as people of medicine, they would rather see the vaccinations get in people's arms than into the garbage can. How many people are flummoxed, flabbergasted, confused, angered to see the Kmart facility over the weekend where the vaccinations are being injected into people's arms? How many people are pissed to see it empty? You? I am. Did you know that the Blue Ridge Health District has a staff shortage in people who could administer the vaccine? So our health district does not have the personnel to rapidly roll out an innovative vaccination that is generational from the impact it can have on mankind, the impact it can have on Americans, on Virginians, on Central Virginians, on Charlottesvillians? I don't have the answer. I do not have the answer. But I'm confused like you. I don't know if it's the National Guard. I don't know if it's giving it to the pharmacies. I do know this. I can go to Wegmans and Fifth Street Station I can walk to the pharmacy with my mask on. I can go to the pharmacist and say, I'm here for my flu shot. They give me, I did this within a, within a month ago. They give me a clipboard and two page, pieces of paper to fill out. It takes me all of three minutes. Then I go into Wegmans, into the little side room by the pharmacy. I take my shirt off, and the pharmacist gives me the flu vaccine in my arm. I put my shirt back on, and I get a receipt for a $10 free pizza from Wegmans. The flu vaccine at Wegmans took me all of 20 minutes tops, and I left with a freaking pepperoni pizza from Wegmans grocery store. Good gosh. Good gosh. Why not do the same concept? Go save lives and get a vaccine that all the world needs and leave with a pepperoni pizza. Seems like perfect common sense to me. Does it not? What are your thoughts? Put them in the feed. Instagram, put them in the feed. Next topic on today's program, positive news. I will commit to positivity on this show. You will see positive content in the rundown. The rundown is the topics you see on screen right below the Ting logo. Judah put on screen how they can save $288 through Ting Fiber Internet. I love Seville.ting.com. I love Seville.ting.com. If you want the best internet in town at the best price possible, we have the best price. I love Seville.ting.com. Positive stuff happening. Okay? Positive stuff. Get ready. Keswick Hall's reopening. A lot of people don't know this. The restaurant inside Keswick Hall, Faucets, it's open to the public. Keswick Hall is a private club, but the restaurant, Faucets, inside Keswick Hall is open to the public. And, and if you go during the week, as this beautiful five-star facility reopens, if you go during the week to faucets and you happen to catch a nice day, and, and God, the Lord has blessed us with some warm days in January so far, okay? We can complain about a lot of things in 2021. One thing we will not complain about so far is the weather. We've had a lot of upper 40s and 50s so far in January. It's been a blessing because we have to be outside more than ever. So let's, let's, let's find positivity in our days. The weather is certain, certainly something to positive to be thankful for. And, and speaking of faucets, if you're able to go during the week on a nice day, you can have a, a, a fantastic cocktail, a meal with your better half, your friend, your special, special somebody, and you can sit outside on the veranda with what is one of the most epic sunsets in central Virginia. Keswick Hall, faucets, faucets open to the public. More positive news. The Ridley is opening in the Draftsman Hotel on West Main. The Ridley, the new restaurant concept from the Draftsman. Remember, it used to be Renewal, 
Renewal was kind of like a, a, a beer bar, self-serve beer bar. They rebranded. Now it's the Ridley. That's going to open soon. Broadcloth is going to open in Woolen Mills. Tucker Yoder's latest concept, the restaurant in Woolen Mills and the Wool Factory. Those are three fantastic restaurant options that we have at our disposal. And I want to thank Scott Aaronworth, the Esquire, the attorney from Virginia Beach that routinely watches the show. Scott Aaronworth often puts things on my radar, and I count on you guys to send me content. If you see something that would make a good topic on the show, please send it to me. It is very much a community effort. I, I would bet 90% of the content you send to me ends up on the rundown and on the show. Because you know what we're trying to do. We're trying to come up with a local type, lo local flavor here. So Little Star, Scott Aaronworth put this on my radar. Little Star, get it on screen, Judah. Get the photo on screen from their Facebook page. Little Star is launching a pop-up. And that pop-up is going to be sandwich-centric. It's no secret why Little Star is offering a pop-up that's sandwich-centric, right? It's no secret. You know what? They previously were tapas food, right? And tapas food does not really scale from a to-go or take-out concept. You know what scales well from a to-go or take-out concept? Sandwiches. Sandwiches most certainly do. So Little Star, doing whatever it can, just like all of us to survive, pivoting its model, doing some sandwiches to uh, take out to go from a pop-up standpoint. I respect it. I respect the hustle. I respect the willingness to change. I, w I respect the willingness to innovate. I really, really do. I will, pr I promise you, I promise you, I will bring you positivity on this show every time you watch. And that right there is some positivity. Reopening of Keswick Hall with a restaurant that anyone can go to, Fawcett's, that has one of the best sunsets and verandas around. You got a, a new restaurant opening on West Main in the Autograph and the Draftsman Hotel, in the Draftsman Hotel. You got the Broadcloth at Woolen Mills, and you got Little Star pivoting to a sandwich pop-up, takeout, carry-out type of concept to survive COVID. Positivity in this community. Give me your thoughts on all that. Now, this is a topic I've covered closely. This is a topic I've, I very much have encouraged the city of Charlottesville, who, who is behind to get more involved and more ahead. You got the governor yesterday rolling out a plan that's going to go to the Virginia Assembly about brick-and-mortar cannabis on the 1st of January 2023, so less than two years from now. It's already legal. It's been decrim decriminalized. You get pop with it, you get a slap on the wrist, maybe a ticket. I don't say it's legal. It's been, it's been decriminalized. So the governor's like, look, we got a budget deficit. We got to make the best thing that ever happened to legalize the weed was COVID. We got a budget deficit. Here, we can utilize this to make up the budget deficit. On top of that, the history, the history behind incarcerating individuals tied to this flower, cannabis, is severely lopsided when it comes to incarcerating people of color versus white people. Just do the research yourself. You can do a basic Google search on this. Three and a half times a disparity, people of color arrested for weed versus white people. I'll say it again. People of color, three and a half times more likely to be incarcerated, arrested because of cannabis versus white people. That's not right. That's wrong. So you get the benefit of the financial stimulus from a 30% tax on retail. They're going to tax this to the tune of 30%. 30%. That's serious tax, serious tax rate right there. So you get the revenue, the incremental revenue for the municipality that's behind with its budget because of COVID. You bridge some social justice inequities, which is always good, always good to bridge those inequities, and you create a new economic ecosystem. Let's think about it, how it's going to pertain to Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Think about the supply chain. The supply chain is not just the growers and the growers that the, uh, and the people the growers employ. The supply chain is lights, fertilizer. The supply chain is transportation. 
The supply chain is graphic design, branding, and advertising associated with the industry. The supply chain could be associated with uniform cleaning. Very much like a restaurant or any under industry, there's a tremendous supply chain associated with the legalization of cannabis. So who are the front runners? Who will be first to market here? You've got to think people like the CBD, the CBD, the people where you can buy and sell CBD in town, or someone like a higher education on West Main. You got to think though, or Roots Rock Reggae on the UVA corner, Lloyd's baby. Is Lloyd still alive for Roots Rock Reggae on the UVA corner? Can anybody help me with that? Is Lloyd still alive? from Roots Rot Reggae, the head shop on the UVA corner. Put it in the feed, I would love to know that answer. You gotta think the head shops are in the driver's seat, right? How about the hemp growers? Are the hemp growers in the driver's seat? Who's the restaurateur in Charlottesville that's gonna start rolling out a menu with, with cannabis-infused ingredients? Who's the brewmaster or which brewery is willing to, to be first to market and take the risk of the cannabis-infused beer, or wine, or cider? How about the tap room? How about Twisted Tea Bazaar? What are they gonna do? Are folks in fine dining gonna try to spruce up fine dining, which is potentially archaic, and only appealing to baby boomers who are dying, and will fine dining think, whoa, Here's an opportunity to add a, a little je ne sais quoi to the experience to get millennials in the door. Is someone going to have the, the Luce of cannabis in Charlottesville? Luce is the pasta window on Market Street. It's about 150 square feet, maybe. No place to sit. Show up to a window. Get pasta. Leave. Cost 10, 12 bucks. It's yummy. Is that going to happen in Charlottesville? These are questions that entrepreneurs are asking and tackling and trying to get ahead. And as this becomes less taboo and more socially accepted, the ones that are doing the hard work now are the ones that are going to have the advantage come January 1st, 2023. And often first to market gets slaughtered and a perfect example of first to market getting slaughtered is Friendster or MySpace. You guys remember Friendster or MySpace, right? First to market, they got slaughtered. Atari, remember Atari, the video console? First to market, they got slaughtered. But second, third, or fourth to market often gains market share and wins. Nintendo, PlayStation, Xbox. Facebook, Twitter. You see what I'm saying? We need to follow this closely. City of Charlottesville is doing nothing when it comes to this. You realize that, right? They are so bogged down in the day-to-day -day of a leadership search and bickering on council that they cannot see the forest through the trees. It's only what's in front. That's not how you lead. How you lead, have you ever read the book, if you're, watch, if you're watching or listening to this show, one of the books that has undoubtedly impacted me as an entrepreneur and business owner, you should write this down, okay? You get this book and you read this book, you will become a better business owner. It's called E-Myth Mastery. Read this book. Buy it. Buy this book so you can put notes in the margins and underline stuff and reference it later like I have. The book is by Michael Gerber. It's called E-Myth Mastery. Read this book. Send me a Christmas card later as a thank you. The entire premise of the book is to work on your business instead of working in your business. Oftentimes, and this comes for local government, this comes for nonprofit, this comes for small business ownership, hell, this comes for relationships. This comes with a mom and dad and a husband and a wife and relationships. How often in our relationships are we so caught up in the day-to-day -day 
of just getting from waking Trey up in the morning to putting Trey down at night and getting from breakfast to the baby in the bath and the baby's pajamas on and the baby sleeping through the night. And this is my personal example. You can make it relatable to your life. How often are we so caught up in the day-to-day with our relationships or our lives that we don't see the bigger picture and make macro goals to help us have a better quality of life or, or, or achieve the goals we want? Oftentimes, we're so caught up in today's Monday, today's, today's Wednesday. I have to pay these bills. i got to do this show. I hope this kid sleeps through the night. Let's see if we can get him into the bath. And this is me talking, that you don't see the big picture. Work on your business instead of in your business. Work on your relationship instead of in your relationship. All right, Crystal Napier. Uh, I'm going to reach out to Crystal here on the program. I love Wednesdays. I love catching up with her. Hey, what's up, Crystal? Hey, Jerry. How you doing? I'm doing well. What's good with you? Uh I'm, I am trying to keep, get the balls, keep them in the air. I guess that's the best way to put it. <laughs> How are you doing with that? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I, I took a little bit of a, a little break and um, got a little R&R in last week. And so I'm, I'm good. I'm ready to go for yeah. this year. Yeah. I yeah. love it. I love it. I love it. Um, you on Wednesday spotlight entrepreneurs that are doing big things before we get to mm-hmm. an entrepreneur that's doing a big time thing. How about one of my favorite entrepreneurs in you? How is oh, well, Crystal Napier and her family? <laughs> uh, the family is good. Um, I was so tickled this morning. I heard Micah running up the steps. Sean said, let's go. Let's go make sure mommy is up. And I heard Micah running down the steps talking about mommy, mommy, mommy. Um, so I'm really excited to be saying mommy now because it took him two years to finally say mommy. It was all about that act. Did you, um, when he said it for the good. first time, when he said mommy for the first time, <laughs> what, was, what happened? Did you start crying? I remember when Trey said daddy for this first time. Dude, I got so chugged up. And I got a really good story for you. The first time Trey said mommy was, yeah. on, was on my wife's birthday. Oh, that's so sweet. Right? That is so adorable. Yeah. I, I, I did. I was elated when he finally said mommy because I've been trying to get him to say mommy. I wanted that to be his first word, but no, it was da 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 da. So when he said mommy, I was like, oh, thank you. Finally, finally. <laughs> Crystal, but, does, um, does, I, Micah, does Micah have uh, Jimmy Fallon's dada book? No. So Jimmy Fallon no. wanted uh, Jimmy Fallon wanted his kids' um, first words to be dada. So uh-huh. he wrote a book, and it's just basically like it's it's a book for Mike and Trey's age, uh, younger probably, and like it's yeah. the word dada on like every page in like different font and different characters around it. I bet he would love it. I know Sean would love it, but the whole concept is dada. <laughs> I'm not going to get that book. I'm going to leave that up to Sean. Sean is probably watching. So if you want that book, babe, go, go for it. But I'm over him saying that okay, everything okay. was that. Okay. So we need, we need Crystal Napier to come out with a book. That's mama. Exactly. Exactly. Now that I will buy. <laughs> oh man. I love catching up with you. I love seeing you smile here. Tell us about the owner of Devotions Hair Studio. So i um, highlighting Marquita Carey Franklin today. Um, and the, the reason I wanted to spotlight her uh, because she's just a humble, incredible hairdresser, number one of all different types of hair types, um, ladies of all walks of life I've seen in her salon. And the positive thing about Marquita is that 2020 did not stop her show. The pandemic did not stop Marquita's show. She was, um, she's been a hairdresser, my personal hairdresser, um, for several years. And then she's been in the industry for 19 plus years. And she was at the hair cuttery 
and decided to step out on faith in the middle of a pandemic and start her own salon That's awesome. last year. Yeah. How incredible was that? Um, she also she also got married what? last year. <laughs> she started a business and she got married during a pandemic. She's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So I thought she would be an incredible person to just spotlight and to just show the positivity um, that came out of last year. And, um, you know, nobody did that better than Marquita with getting married. Um, She has two beautiful children. Um, So just watching her operate as a mother, a wife, and now a business owner um, has just been incredible. You know, I know she she asked me a few months when she was kind of thinking about it, about uh, her logo and um, like, who did I use for my bookkeeping? And I was thinking, oh, okay, Marquita's going to start her own salon. Yeah, she's getting serious. Yeah, yeah. And then just like that, she, you know, one day I went into her and she was like, hey, Crystal, next month. I need you to come to my salon, which is uh, at 2300 Commonwealth Drive in Charlottesville. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. You know, the parking is great. I don't have to worry about fighting the Barracks Road traffic. (laughs) And um, she's been flourishing. And I said, Marquita, you know, with the pandemic, when you were at Haircuttery, I know, you know, times were challenging. They had to shut down because Governor, Governor Northam shut down everything. And she said it really was. And people are still very nervous to, you know, come into the salon. And I said, well, what do you attribute your success to? And she said, the referrals, you know, awesome clients um, are just keep referring me to other people. And I know that's true because um, actually being on your show, Jerry, <laughs> I have gotten so many messages after I do the show of, Crystal, who does your hair? What products do you use? Um, Because you're beautiful. I know that. Thank you. Her her work speaks for itself. Like she just does an incredible job. She's so gentle um, with what she does. And she's just paved the way for, you know, stepping out and doing it on, on her own, which is, incredible and I applaud her. What? This is what, here's the hardest question I'm going to ask you in six months. Are you ready for this? Okay. I'm what, nervous. what, <laughs> what is the conversation like in the salon between Crystal and Marquita over an hour of her doing your hair? Because I have a feeling you guys are talking about anything and everything and there are no rules whatsoever. You know, uh, Marquita and I, we, we, we share a lot of laughs over, motherhood. Uh, We shared some tears. Um, I know uh, one of the stories that she told me was her son is 16 and he started his first job. And one of the things of last year that made him nervous with him finally getting his license and gaining more independence, he said, it makes me really nervous to drive if I see a cop. Um, So we've had, you know, very intimate conversations, um, just as being black women, black mother owners. Um, and it's really a, a therapeutic time for me. Like that, you know, I, I put <laughs> Marquita faithfully on my schedule, um, to make sure that I'm going to utilize her services, not just because she does an awesome, amazing job on my hair. Um, but she's just, such a professional. She does her due diligence. I've watched her consistently, you know, sanitizing her, her shop, making sure that she's always wearing her mask, that the customers are always wearing their mask. Like she's just, uh, you can tell like, this is, this is truly her passion. Like she, she, she really enjoys what she does. Um, and I think that's what really makes the difference of all of our small business owners, that passion and that level of care uh, that we have over our businesses and that stewardship, it really sets us apart from those big box stores, you know? Um, and Well said. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I was just trying to think of what else I can say about this incredible woman. How did she I, answer I, I, that? I, I, how did she answer that question with her son? 
about being 16 and driving and being nervous by a police officer. Yeah, she she said, um, you know, it, it it hurt her to hear that. Um, and she was telling him about, you know, always having your ID ready. Uh, her and I then went down another rabbit hole of talking about how um, this young uh young African American boy actually I think he was twelve or fourteen has came up with a uh some type of holder that you can put on your window for your ID so you don't even have to open the door carry it in your wallet. Oh gotcha. Yeah. yeah um I, I can't think of the article but if I if I I know I shared it on my Facebook page so I'll scroll through and send it to you. Um so we were just you know talking about what we can do to protect our sons um, and to protect ourselves and just about how, you know, I was telling her about when they talk about defund the police, you know, that's the, that's the term that they've put on it. But I think it needs to, people need to understand what that really means. It's not about just taking money from the police. It's not about taking money from them at all. It's, about reallocating and making sure that we're training folks um, and understanding what racial bias is and understanding what privilege is and having having a society where we're all treated fairly and with equity um, instead of, you know, stereotyping skin colors and we are playing a different game when it comes to a certain skin color. You know, you just mentioned it earlier in your show about the marijuana, like the facts are there. Like, you know, that you can't refute facts. You can't refute uh, statistics. And more than ever, we just got to really look at the situation and and take the blinders off. Cause I, I feel like it's a lot of, it's still a lot of willful blindness, even though we have the truth right in front of us. And I think that's the part that kind of frustrates me. That's what frustrates, um, you know, Marquita. And we've had those conversations about that. This, so. this is, I, and I, let's go down this road. This is a real, very real conversation here. I was talking about this last week. Um, some of the shootings that we've had in Charlottesville, these mm-hmm. shootings have been like, I mean, as you know, you read the news, you follow the news as I do, like ambush style shootings where the police are seeing like 30 shell casings on the scene. And I made the point mm-hmm. last week, if these shootings had happened in North downtown, Greenbrier, around the downtown mall, those million plus row houses between Beer Run and C&O Restaurant, Johnson Village, or any of these historically white neighborhoods, we would have... We would have the national news in Charlottesville, Virginia right now. But the shootings have happened in historically African-American neighborhoods, and they're not even really truly penetrating the news cycle outside of a 30-second blurp on the news. I find it Mm -hmm. terrible, terrible. I'm curious of your take on this. Um, You know, I've... That's not new to me, though. Like, that, you know, and I want to say that that this is this is truly what Charlottesville media has did historically. You know that it they don't they purposely do not show um, what's really going on um, in our towns and especially in our black neighborhoods and and that's a problem. Um, Why would they do that? Well, number one, they they want to show that you know, Charlottesville is, is like this utopia. Of <laughs> that's why it's, that's a hundred percent right. And it's, it's, everything is great. Yeah. Huh? That's you're a hundred percent right. They want, they want the moniker best town in America and you can't have the moniker yes. best town in America. If you've got ambush shootings going on. Absolutely. 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 Um, you, uh, you are awesome. You always get us thinking. You always provide great commentary on this show. Um, how about, um, how about a, a peek, a snapshot? What's going on with your business, Renee's Boutique? So um, in the middle of starting the, the changes with my website, 
Um, so I'll, I will keep you all posted as soon as I <laughs> see the results. I'm really excited about that. And uh, we are still having our winter clearance event going on. It's 40% off. Um, adding a few more pieces to our winter collection. Um, one is right behind me. This uh, amazingly comfortable, soft, uh, rust leopard sweatshirt with faux leather pants. Um, just a few more comfortable pieces for ladies to be warm and cozy um, whenever the winter decides to hit us. Because as you said, it's been excellent weather. It's, it's surprisingly excellent weather. Right. Um, you are awesome. Renee's Boutique LLC.com. Renee's Boutique LLC.com. Check her out, please, online. Crystal, thank you, thank you, thank you for the time today on the show. Thank you, Jerry. Have a wonderful day. You have day. a good one too, Crystal. Um, I want to, uh, I want to kind of dot the I's and cross the T's on a couple things from this conversation. I brought this up on last week's show, but I think it's really important to emphasize this again. Okay. And I'm going to take a macro look at this and then a micro look at this. When Americans go missing or when something happens to Americans when they're on vacation and they're traveling overseas to a place like Europe or the Caribbean. The stories that garner the most attention from the national media are when a white blonde woman that's often very pretty goes missing. And when this white blonde woman who's often very pretty goes missing, the national media leverages a headshot, a photo of her, and plasters it all over the 24-7, 24-hour news cycle that we live in today. You can't argue with me there. That's the story. When an American goes missing or a crime happens to an American overseas, the one that gets the most attention is when a white, blonde, pretty girl goes missing. Let's take it locally to Charlottesville. There's someone from our community in Sage Smith, Sage Smith is a, a, a trans, transgender woman of color from this area. Transgender woman of color. She's been missing for over eight years from this community. Barely gets a ripple in the news cycle. Certainly not from an effort for law enforcement to find where Sage Smith has fallen. Now let's localize it even more. If the shootings had happened, these ambush style shootings where people are being murdered, people are being murdered in Charlottesville, in the city. If these shootings had happened in North Downtown, Greenbrier, Johnson Village, Belmont, or the row houses that are over a million dollars between CNO Restaurant and Beer Run, if they had happened in any of those neighborhoods in the city of Charlottesville, the entire national media would have flooded to this community. Because they've happened in Prospect, Garrett, First Street, West Haven, they barely get a ripple in the news cycle. That is undoubtedly me showing you systematic racism and the national and local news cycles. Do you see it? Now take it a step further. This is what you have to ask yourself. I could, I, this is something I'm very knowledgeable about that I could spend an entire day hosting a, a, a college level course for you guys. I want you to think about this. The folks that are advertising, let's go local first. The folks that are advertising in local media outlets, let's go local first. Let's consider the TV stations, NBC 29 and CBS 19. Let's consider the print media outlets, the Daily Progress and the Seville Weekly. And let's consider the radio stations, 
in Monticello Media and Charlottesville Radio Group. I personally have worked for Monticello Media. I personally have worked for NBC 29. I personally have worked for the Daily Progress. I've worked years in print, years in television, and years in radio before launching this business. I'm speaking from firsthand experience. The businesses locally that are paying to advertise on NBC 29, CBS 19, Monticello Media, Charlottesville Radio Group, the Seville Weekly, and the Daily Progress. These six media outlets, the primary way they stay afloat, keep their lights on, and play their employees is through advertising revenue. The advertising revenue that is coming into radio, television, and print locally is predominantly coming from businesses that are white-owned businesses. As a result, the media outlets who are beholden on their advertisers are then creating content on their newscasts that is more targeted and focused on the people that are paying to keep their lights on. You have a vicious systematic cycle, and I am not even sure how you bust or break the cycle to create social justice and equity. How is probably to champion more media outlets that come from uh, uh, communities of color. But right now, from a local standpoint, Local TV, local print, and local radio. Their bills are paid by advertisers. Listen and watch the commercials. The majority of the advertisers, and by majority, I would, I would bet you it's over 90% of the advertisers. I, I freaking used to do this for a living, dude. I did this for close to 10 years for a living before launching my company. Creating content on radio, creating content on TV, creating content for print, and then selling around that content. I would bet you, I will do a prop bet with you, that over 90% of the folks advertising in, in print, TV, and radio in Charlottesville and the Central Virginia market, I would bet you over 90% of those people are white-owned businesses. So here you have ownership at TV, ownership at print, and ownership at radio. Print, TV, and radio are freaking dying, if you haven't realized that. They're archaic mediums. These things, cell phones, are cannibalizing and eating print, radio, and TV for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So the ownership of dying industries, print, radio, TV, is doing whatever it humanly can to survive and not become the yellow pages, not become the payphone on the side of the gas station, and not become Western Union or the Model T. They're doing whatever they can to survive. And they're sitting there in their boardrooms, and they're looking at their balance sheets, and they're crunching numbers, and they're saying, 90% of the people that are keeping our lights on are white-owned businesses. We must create content that helps get more money in the coffers so we can keep the lights on longer. It's a vicious systematic cycle. The only reason I'm able to not fall into the vicious systematic cycle is because this is not the primary source of income. I, 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 I would be I don't, I don't know how you break this vicious systematic cycle. It must be empowering media from communities of color. Because when media outlets are powered, like we're doing tomorrow with Alex Erpy show. Tomorrow on Alex Erpy show, we're launching a new show tomorrow at 10.15. The entire show is for the Hispanic community. It's called Today y Manana. I'm not even going to be on this set talking. I'm not even going to be here. It's going to be Alex Erpy and his father spotlighting the Hispanic community. Alex and his father do whatever they want with the revenue that comes with the, from the show. I, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's maybe how we figure it out is, I guess, how we're trying to do it here. You cannot go 
to the TV station, the newspaper, the radio station, and say, I want a show every week to spotlight the Hispanic community, the African-American community, and you cannot get a show on air. It doesn't work that way. They have strong rules they have to follow, and they have, they have content they're con contractually obligated to air on their stations. Syndicated content. They're contractually obligated to air Wheel of Fortune in Jeopardy and all the programming we see at night on NBC 29. They cannot say, we are not going to air these programs, and instead, we're going to air Today e Manana by Alex Erpe or the Crystal Napier show that spotlights our fabulous community. They cannot do that. They would lose their license and distinction as an NBC affiliate. They must air NBC content. However, I can air whatever the hell I want, whenever the hell I want, how often I want, without cutting into commercial breaks. And I can create content that is freaking real and raw and authentic and may cause you to cringe and why it could cause you to cringe is because I'm saying real shit that matters. And it's not just a 30-second blurb on a topic. It's real life stuff. And if I saw ambush shootings in Belmont and Greenbrier and North Downtown and Johnson Village on Water Street, around Market Street, or any of the traditionally white neighborhoods, I can assure you the national media would be here. That's not happening. It's not happening now. And that's wrong. And I'm not 100% sure how to fix it. Um, all right, a couple more things I want to get out. Keith and Jonas Smith are launching a new business alliance with Keller Williams. Can you get their logo up? Yes, Realty Partners. This is going to be a banging new business. The Yes Team Realtors, Keith and Jonas Smith's business. Keith Smith of The Real Talk, Tuesdays and Fridays on the I Love Seville Network. 2020 was the best year they've ever had in company history, the Yes Team Realtors. They formed a business partnership with the illustrious, the esteemed, the famous, the generous, the gregarious, the Brad Pitt look-alike, Quentin Beckham. Quentin Beckham they formed a partnership with. And it's called Yes Realty Partners. Guys, I, I'm calling it right now Yes, Realty Partners is going to go bananas. It's going to catch fire. It's going to be one of the most trusted names in real estate in this community. Watch it. Watch it boom. Watch it. Watch it boom. Speaking of real estate, can we talk home sales in the Shenandoah Valley really quickly? Let me give you a couple of metrics here. You want to know why the Shenandoah Valley is booming? Harrisonburg, Rockingham County, Waynesboro. You want to know why? Do you want to know what the... Uh, Median sales price in the Shenandoah Valley was in 2020. The median sales price in the Shenandoah Valley in 2020 was $269,000. $269,000. That's for detached homes. The median sales price in this area, add an extra $200,000 to that. And the four's approaching a five. That's why this place is booming. You get more house for half the money. Yes, you have to commute. But in the age of COVID and in the ubiquitous nature of Wi-Fi and, and, and strong ISP and the fact that you could work from home, the commute's not as big of a deal. $269,000 dollars. The median sales price in the Shenandoah Valley. Virginia Tech News, only 6% of students will go in person spring semester in Blacksburg. Virginia Tech president said that yesterday. Only 6% of students will learn in a classroom during the spring semester at Virginia Tech. And UVA plays Notre Dame today. The Wahoos are a nine and a half point favorite. Tip off 4.30 p.m. UVA is a top 25 ball club by ranking. 
They do not have any marquee victories on their resume. They've got three wins in the Atlantic Coast Conference, those three wins against the three worst teams in the ACC, Notre Dame, Boston College, and Wake Forest. The Hoos play the Fighting Irish yet again today. They're a nine-and-a-half-point favorite. They do not have a marquee victory on their resume. They played Gonzaga, and they got ran out of the gym. Follow the team closely, a lot of talent there. Put your comments in the feed. I'm gonna talk some Donald Trump for a moment. I don't often talk Donald Trump because he's such a polarizing figure and a polarizing brand. And frankly speaking, I don't bring national, national politics to this show that's about the best of Charlottesville, Virginia. However, I feel compelled to offer some perspective on Donald Trump and what I think is gonna happen over the next few years. Get ready, buckle up, sit back, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. When you take a man who's got a personality profile that's narcissistic, a man who's got a personality profile that's vendetta-esque, we know he's a, he's a guy that remembers grudges and holds grudges. We know he's a man who's motivated by vendettas and people who say you can't do something and restrict what he can do. And we know he's a narcissist. Everything I've said is basic psychology 101. It does not take a therapist or a psychologist to offer analysis that I just said. It's just basic. When you tell a narcissist, when you tell someone who holds grudges, when you tell someone who has economic resources and a vast network and over 70 million voters that he cannot post on YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, and just about every social media platform out there, what are you creating? What are you actually doing? You're creating and motivating someone that has means, connections, influence, and over 70 million followers, and you're motivating that particular person to create his own media brand. So instead of Facebook saying, you can't post here, instead of Twitter saying, you can't air your thoughts here, instead of YouTube saying, you can't post that photo, Donald, Instead of Snapchat saying, Donnie boy, no more disappearing DPs for you. No more disappearing DPs for you, Donnie boy. What he's going to do now is build his own digital media brand that he has absolute autonomy and control of. That's a much scarier proposition than posting content itself on platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, LinkedIn, et cetera, where that content can be algorithmed up and down. So get ready for it. Whether it's called Trump TV or the Trump Media Network, it's coming fast, hard, and it's going to be something we've never seen before. Perhaps not since Ted Turner launched CNN have we seen what's coming down the pipe. And when Ted Turner launched CNN, it had an impact that this country is still experiencing, and that's 24-hour news. Think about Fox, but even more right and even more propaganda, and with no rules, no FCC. Think about it. All right, I got to get out of here. New show tomorrow at 10, 15 a.m. Alex Erpe and his father. Um, today, E. Manana on the I Love Seville Network, geared toward the Hispanic community. It will be a show done in Spanish and English. I cannot wait to see what these gentlemen have cooking. They have absolute autonomy on this program. It's going to be something awesome. Um, I Love Seville Daily Digest, 5 o'clock. Remember the I Love Seville Daily Digest. It's this entire show in five minutes or less, five days a week uh, on the I Love Seville Network. Um, thank you, guys. I love this comment. I love this. Um, Laura Sherling. Jerry, I love your show because you speak your mind. You're not afraid to speak the truth. And the fact that you don't have to go into commercials allows you to make a point that really resonates with me week in and week out. 
thank you for doing this show for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, all right, I got to get to work. I'm Jerry. It's the I Love Seville Show for Judah Wickhauer, for Crystal Napier. Thank you for joining us tomorrow at 10.15 a.m. I think it's going to be... Is it the first talk show with a visual done in Charlotte? I know there's been radio. Has there, any, has there ever been a Spanish talk show with video in Charlottesville history? Has there ever been... I know there's been radio. Has there ever been a Spanish talk show with video weekly in Charlottesville, Virginia history? Are we making Charlottesville, Virginia history tomorrow at 1015 on the I Love Seville Network? Help me understand. I've only been in this community 20 years. I came here as a doe-eyed, wide-eyed freshman, first year, excuse me, first year at the University of Virginia, who was focused on, on, on not school. I'll leave it at that. Is this, are we making history tomorrow at 1015? Someone let me know. Put it in the feed or send me a DM with, with Alex Erpi and Xavier Erpi's Today in E Manana, a Spanish talk show on the I Love Civil Network. I will have that answer for you tomorrow. You guys have a good one. Take care.